Hi, it's Alexa again, and today we're going to be talking about overvoltage protection and the maximum input voltage for the Thunderscope front end. As we mentioned in the last video, the maximum measurement range is 40 volts peak to peak for the 1 mega ohm path and 4 volts peak to peak for the 50 ohm path. Now the question is, how much higher than this can you go without really starting to break things? That is an easier question to answer for the 50 ohm path, so let's start with that. In this path, uh, you're not really limited by how much voltage is coming out of this attenuator. You're limited by the fact that you have essentially a 50 ohm resistor that you're putting a bunch of voltage through. So you're going to start burning a lot of power. You may notice that the power rating for these parts is 0.33 watts. Let's uh, take a look at the part that I'm actually using for this. Um, it's a 0.33 watt resistor in 0603 package. So that's actually pretty cool. Uh, it's a high power rating for a small part and it is a pulse withstanding part. So what that means is it can take a uh, much higher power in short durations than a normal resistor without uh, like popping like a fuse. So essentially mathing this out, you come to basically a five volt limit because five volts across 50 ohms ends up being 0.1 amps and putting that through the highest value in this little chain, the 30 ohms, is 0.1 squared times 30 is 0.3 watts, which is pretty close to the 0.33. So we can basically call this one uh, 5 volts RMS. Now, why RMS? It's the definition. Um, it is the equivalent voltage uh, that would heat a resistor to the DC voltage. So whatever AC you put in there, that is 5 volts RMS, is going to heat this as much as 5 volts DC will. And by that, I mean put 0.3 watts across it, through it, I guess. So that's that. And uh, this number is convenient because this buffer can sink 0.1 amps through its clamp diodes. So we're going to get to that in a minute. This is going to be more tricky because it's just a higher voltage. Hopefully, we'd have this attenuator uh, on when we apply that high voltage, but that's not something we can count on. When the device is off, it's the default path, so that's good. But when the device is on, the user is allowed to go to any voltage range they want. So say you want to look at a high voltage signal, you wanted 10 volts per division, but then you keyed in 10 millivolts per division. Well, you're going to put it across the 1x path here, and it better survive it. So uh, let's look at that path now. don't think it likes me drawing over it, but here you go. So we go through this path here. So let's look at this from a DC perspective first. In DC, you slam into this capacitor and the buffer is safe, no problem. And then you come down here through this 909K resistor. And then this part has clamping diodes as well to both rails. So really, you're not stressing this part out a lot because for, say, 50 volts DC here, you would be essentially burning like slightly over 50 microamps um, in those diodes. So no problem. However, what happens if you go above 50 volts? Well, 
The weakest link is actually this resistor right here. That's a 0402. And it's a pretty standard 0402. And they have a maximum working voltage of 50 volts. Now, I could make this a little higher by going 0603, but looking at the layout, there is not a lot of space. But that's actually fine. We can quite reasonably limit it to 100 volts peak to peak, which is pretty good comparing to the 40 volts peak to peak that is truly the useful maximum limit for, uh, for measurement. So that's not bad. But then we look at it as an AC signal, 100 volts peak to peak. What happens? This basically stays constant. It's resistor. You're just going to burn 50 microamps in both diodes going in both directions. No problem. But then, okay, we're going to have to delete that. But then you end up going through this capacitor because you're AC and we start dealing with the uh, the clamp on this buffer. So we basically get a five volts for free from the rails, plus minus 0 0.1 amps times the impedance presented by this plus this 10 ohm over here. So that turns into a frequency dependent term because we have a capacitor in there now. I don't know why this is doing this now, but we're just going to roll with it. So, uh, so yeah, um, this is frequency dependent. So this number here is not going to be the same over frequency. Let's take a look at some other oscilloscopes and see how they deal with it. So this is a Tektronix scope, 300 VRMS. That's the rating you're going to see next to the BNCs. It's a big number, but what you don't see is this, D rate above 4 megahertz at 20 dB per decade. So that is going to plummet with frequency. But this might just be a fluke. Ha. Huh. So let's look at another scope. Here's a very fancy Tektronix scope. 50 ohms has 5 VRMS. Oh, yeah, same as us. That's good. With some peaks. That's uh, probably for the pulse withstanding, so seems like we're on the right track there. Now back to the 1 mega ohm mode. More derating over frequency. Okay. The signal and scope just says DC to 10 kilohertz. So uh, what the rating is after 10 kilohertz, no idea. Oh, and they're also 5 volts RMS for 50 ohms. And the Keysight scope here just has one number. So no idea. Picoscope is uh, another computer-connected scope, and their ratings are a little lower than the uh, benchtop equivalents. But that's actually fine. I like to uh, take some of their examples, uh, as Thunderscope is also going to be connected to a computer. And to limit my liability, I'm going to stay within what's called like extra low voltage uh, or not hazardous live, which are basically these ratings here. So 100 volts peak to peak. It basically keeps us within a relatively safe uh, region for people to be probing. So uh, yeah, don't uh, don't probe some like crazy high voltages with this thing. Um, that's not what it's designed for. So before we come back to our equation here, I would also like to note the importance of the 0.1 amps here. Uh, we already calculated 0.1 amps is the most that this uh, 30 ohm here can take. And it also applies to these 30 ohms right here. The Z in this equation, 
is the impedance, and that's just the series impedance of a, uh, a resistor. So that's uh, root the resistance value of 70 ohms squared plus 1 over 2 pi uh, fc squared. That is completely legible, but that's fine because I have graphed it in Desmos. So this red graph is what we have right now uh, on the uh, board. And we'll talk about that blue graph uh, in a second. So as you can see here, for 100V peak to peak, this is an amplitude. So we are looking at uh, 50. So that's that rating is valid up to 16 kilohertz, basically. And then it will come down past what is technically safe for our circuit in 1x mode. So again, back to that attenuator switching off and then damaging uh, the rest of the front end. That can technically happen uh, if you apply something greater than uh, 20 volts at uh, greater than 54.5 kilohertz here. And then it kind of flattens out and it flattens out to 12 volts because that cap is basically doing nothing. So you're just drawing the 0.1 milliamps uh, through 70 ohms. So you get seven volts from that, five volts from the uh, rails. So that's your 12 volts. Um, there is technically nothing stopping you from applying that higher voltage, right? This is just the safe operating region that kind of is under the curve. And then over the curve is like the, uh, the spicy might break your scope voltage region. So this blue curve is actually a change I've been thinking about doing. And this video is actually really insightful uh, for my own design work uh, improving Thunderscope, because when I see it like this, it really makes me realize, yeah, that's a good improvement. Um, so this blue curve is essentially just, what if you change that capacitor uh, here, this capacitor, from 22 nanofarads to 330 picofarads. That is, actually a very, very low value, probably lower than what I would actually want to go. And that's because of some reasons that we'll discuss in another video, but it shows that with a lower value, you can just move this curve wherever you, wherever you want, basically. So this one's nice because for 330 picofarads, you can basically claim that 100 volt peak to peak rating all the way up to one megahertz and then do your little you know, D rate by 20 dB per decade uh, down to 12 uh, volts, which isn't even a full decade, but yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially what's limiting us there, the resistors and then the capacitor up here. So yeah, I'm probably going to change this to be a higher capacitance value just to bring us a little more in line with those Tektronix scopes, which uh, basically hold their rating up to four megahertz and then start derating. And another thing is that the DC and AC components are, are separate here. So even though the rating is kind of for overall, uh, if you're close to the top end of that rating in uh, DC, then you can still see whatever AC is remaining completely fine. And that's because, right, like the DC lives here and then the buffer just sees that AC. The other thing is these ratings are all for like your absolute worst case scenario of a 1x input on one mega ohm mode, which is already pretty uncommon because you'd normally be using a 50 ohm input for direct connection like that. Um, but if you were using say a 1x probe, uh, then that's something you can encounter. Uh, for use with 10x probes, right, you have another divider there. So you basically kind of uh, 
merge the derating curve of the probe with the derating curve of the scope. So you're going to be safer for longer. And uh, just to spice things up, I'm going to show you that the uh, probe has more capacitors in it. Yay! Frequency dependence. Um, and that this also has capacitors in it. So just a little teaser for another video. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, derating curves are pretty weird. Uh, I haven't heard them talked about very much for scopes themselves, uh, but it is very much a thing. And it is something that you can understand about scopes most easily when you actually have a schematic of a front end. Uh, and unfortunately, there isn't really a great way to get one of those. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad to, to share the open source design of Thunderscope with everyone and hopefully get everyone thinking about how their trusty piece of lab equipment actually works. Awesome. Thank you all.